Well, hi, church. Hope you're having a great day so far. It is such an honor to be able to bring the word of God today and to speak to you. And I am believing that God is going to speak to each individual heart and that we are going to leave changed after hearing his word today. And how many of you are so thankful for pastors Julie and Damien? I am so thankful for them. Absolutely. Um, You know, I've been on the journey with these guys for over a decade now. Coming up in January, it will be 11 years. And I just want to tell you, and I think we know this about them, but I just want to say it like they are the real deal. They love Jesus. They love the house of God. Um, They keep the main thing the main thing. And they have personally shepherded my soul through really dark seasons and through the good times. And I'm so thankful for them for that. And I just want us to acknowledge that. So even, you know, in the chat today, just pour some thanks out, some appreciation, some love on our pastors because we have incredible pastors and we are part of a wonderful church. So let's not uh, take that for granted. But today we are going to be continuing on our journey through the book of Philippians. I have been so enjoying this series on Philippians, going through chapter one, two, and three, hearing from pastors Damien, Anna Gray, and John, and just gleaning so much wisdom from this incredible letter written by the Apostle Paul. And today we are gonna dive into the final chapter. We're there. We're gonna dive into chapter four, and we're gonna read through the entirety of this chapter, and then we're gonna look at a section of it together. And just keep this in mind for context. Again, this is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Philippi. He's in prison while he is writing this letter. And so you are gonna hear references to different people's names, um, situations that are happening at that point in history with that church as we read this together. So I'm gonna be reading out of the NIV. And again, we'll read through the entirety of chapter four. So here we go. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm, in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my coworkers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Yet it was good of you to share in my trouble. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. The brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So amazing. And you know what? There's so many standout verses in that chapter, aren't there? But you know, today we're going to focus specifically on verses six through nine and take a look 
and what I like to call a three-step action plan to deal with worry and anxiety. And you know, it's a plan that God gives us to take us off the mental path of anxiety and place us on the pathway to peace. So if you're looking for a title for this sermon as you take notes, it is this, a pathway to peace, a pathway to peace. So let's cycle back to the top of verse six and we're gonna reread it. This is what it says. Think about these words, church. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. What a beautiful scripture. It's actually one of my favorites. I've clung to it many times in my life. Uh, Beautiful scripture and promise from God. And you know, Just as we delve into this topic of worry and anxiety, I want to put a little caveat um, because I realize the meaning of this word anxiety can have different interpretations for different people, you know, and there is really a debilitating anxiety that can be linked to mental health uh, disorders. And although the scripture and the principles offered can absolutely be applied to that, let's also use wisdom and know when to seek professional help. You know, thankfully, we live in a day and age where there's so much resource available for us, psychologists, psychiatrists, there's medication, group therapy. Um, And I just want to emphasize from the start that it is not a lack of faith to use these things, to use these resources. I feel like for too long, uh, you know, in the church, people have felt shame and condemnation, like I just don't have enough faith, or I didn't pray enough. You know, Philippians says, just pray, you know, and God's peace is going to guard my heart and mind. Yes, that's true. But it is also okay to go and seek resources. And you know, If you are someone listening to this and you are dealing with debilitating anxiety and a mental health issue, we have an amazing pastoral care team. You can reach out and they will help connect you with resources, okay? You are not alone. Just want to say that from the top. You're not alone. Now, that being said, I think all of us at some level have experienced some kind of worry or anxiety. You know, it's it's kind of part of our fallen nature as people to fret to have what ifs, worries about everyday life. You know, we can lose sleep over stuff, things that just make us anxious. We're thinking about problems that we're trying to solve. What if this happens? What if this doesn't happen? And sometimes we just want to have so much control. Like, oh, I really want to control the situation and I just can't. And we lose peace about it. If you are anything like me, you have a mind that is very good at ruminating. Like if rumination was an Olympic sport, I would be a top contender. I am great at ruminating. I am great at thinking things over and over and over and over again to the point that I'm like, brain, seriously, this is the same information you were bringing up for the 20th time today or more. This is not new. Don't need to think it again. I'm trying to let go of this. Um, So yeah, I'm great at ruminating. I am also very good. I'm very good at catastrophizing. Okay, I can go from zero to 60 pretty fast. Okay, give me a situation like, did I forget to turn off my hair straightener? I'm driving to work. I don't remember if I did. Uh, All of a sudden, my house is burning down. The neighborhood is burning down. I am an old woman living in desolation, rocking in a rocking chair, in a house filled with cats, staring into an abyss of hopelessness. Like, just because I don't know if I turned my hair straightener off. So, do I have any friends? Like, any ruminators, catastrophizers? Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? I laugh at myself, but truly, if I'm being honest, I have personally had to work through issues of worry and strongholds of anxiety. And I have had to push through and learn how I can get to the other side where there is a place of freedom, where there is a place of peace. Did you know, this is interesting, the biblical word for worry is a Greek word. Now, I have a Canadian accent and I only speak English, so if I don't say this correctly, I apologize. Um, But it's miram now. And it's a combination of two Greek words, okay? The first one is marizo, which means to divide, and nous, which is mind. So literally, worry is the mind divided. Okay, Max Licato in his book, Traveling Light, explains it this way, anxiety, splits our energy between today's priorities, 
and tomorrow's problems. So part of our mind is on the now and the rest is on the not yet. And the result is half-minded living. So what do we do about this church? Because God does not want us to waste all this mental energy worrying and being anxious and ruminating and catastrophizing. But the good news is, even though this is a very normal human reaction that can happen inside our minds, the good news is God has not left us to our own. He has given us literally a plan, what we can do in the book of Philippians with very practical steps that I want to talk through today. And they are simply this. Number one, pray. Number two, give thanks. And number three, focus your thoughts. Pray, you give thanks, and you focus your thoughts. Now, easier said than done. It does take discipline and practice. But truly, the more you do it and you get in the habit of going through that step, going through those steps, it does get easier with time, with that discipline of doing it. So we are gonna break down those three steps specifically today and take a look at each one and how we can apply it to our lives. Are we ready, church? Yes. All right, step one, the first thing the Apostle Paul tells us to do is pray, or petition is the other word. A petition being a special request for something that you desire. And what is prayer? Okay, prayer is simply talking with the Lord. It's having a conversation with God. It's sharing what's on your heart, what's on your mind with him. And, you know, it's never in vain. It's never in vain when we pray because sometimes it can get frustrated thinking, I have prayed about this over and over and I'm not seeing results. But we know the truth of the word of God. We know that in the book of James, it says that prayer is both powerful and it is effective. The Bible wouldn't say that if it wasn't true. It is powerful it is effective. What does that mean? It means prayer works. It means that God answers. And I think it's interesting that the first thing that Paul says to do is to pray. Because, you know, think about it. He doesn't say, don't be anxious, but go eat lots of chocolate. Listen, if I wrote the book of Philippians, that's probably what I would write, okay? That's why the Holy Spirit did not write the book, did, you know, did not ask me to write a book, write the book. God did not ask me to write the book of Philippians, I would have put that as my, my go-to. Go eat some chocolate. Uh, it did not say, don't be anxious, but go do some retail therapy, you know? Go spend lots of money, go rack up the debt. It doesn't say, don't be anxious, but, you know, go indulge in that secret escape or that unhealthy relationship. It doesn't say that. And I wonder if it says to pray, because that's not always our first response, but our last resort. We turn to so many other things that maybe temporarily alleviate the anxiety, but in the long run, it doesn't. It doesn't actually solve the problem or get rid of the anxiety. The late Christian writer and speaker, Corey Tenboom asked this question. She said, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? And that is a good question because you know what? Sometimes we can treat prayer like an extra, like that thing, like the car breaks down, your life breaks down. Oh, okay, I gotta pray. Lord, I'm lifting up this prayer to you, help me out. Instead of it being that thing that guides our life, you are holding on to it. It is helping you move in the right direction towards the Lord, God's purposes for your life. It reminds me of uh, a famous hymn by a man named Joseph Scrivens. Uh, you may know it. it's called What a Friend We Have in Jesus. And those lyrics that go, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And then maybe you know the melody, it goes, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And you know, if you look at the story of this man, Joseph Scrivens, you see a life marked with tragedy. Look it up, it's an incredible story. But he was actually engaged two times. Both his fiancés died. Uh, his first fiancé died the night before their wedding, she drowned. And he never actually did marry. He just devoted his life to the Lord. And if you travel to Port Hope, Ontario, you can actually visit his gravesite. And you can see the words of that hymn on his tombstone. And you know, he could have lived his life crippled with worry. And I mean, we don't know the ins and outs of everything he battled with in his life. I'm sure there was worry and anxiety. But the words of that hymn 
are really pointing and showing us a man who was learning how to lean on the Lord and how to lean on prayer in times of trouble. Because the truth is that we are called as a church, as people who are part of God's kingdom, to pray without ceasing, to continually pray. Think about this in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds, all kinds of prayers and requests. We can pray anytime about anything. There is nothing that is too big that God can't handle. There is nothing too small that it escapes his notice. And you know, personally, I've had big prayers answered where I'm like, God, if you don't show me which direction to go, I don't know, like left or right, show me God. And he does. I've had smaller prayers answered like, where are my car keys, Lord? And he, you know, <laughs> need that parking spot, Lord, help me out. And you know, I've also uh, you know, I have prayers that I'm waiting on the Lord to answer. That's a hard place to be in too. Or prayers that I've prayed and the answer wasn't what I wanted. And that's a hard place too. But I still cling to the truth, no matter what the answer is to the prayer, that God is listening, okay? He cares. He is attentive to our needs. That's the kind of God we serve, right? He is not distant. He's not uninvolved in your life. He's very much into the details. He is an ever-present help in times of trouble. That is the truth of the word of God. We can't base what we, our lives on all the time, what we feel, but we go back to what does the word say? I feel like this prayer isn't getting answered, but God, I know the truth that you are with me. You're listening. You care. You will work this out for good. If you're feeling maybe a little uninspired to pray or you're in that season of defeat where you feel like you're praying and praying and praying and just there's no breakthrough, no breakthrough. Can I encourage you to go look up, read, listen to stories of amazing Christian men and women through history like Joseph Scrivens or this other guy I'm gonna talk about. His name is George Mueller. Um, George Mueller was born in England in 1805. And in his youth, he was involved in gambling and stealing. And he ended, actually ended up in jail at the age of 16 because of his criminal activity. And then in his early 20s, God got a hold of his heart. And actually the Lord started working in his heart and placing in him a heart of compassion for orphans and street children. And he basically started his mission for the Lord with 50 cents in his pocket. And over his lifetime, saw incredible financial donations of like over $7 million. And that's a lot in the 1800s. I mean, that's a lot today, but that's a lot back then. And he was able to build five enormous buildings that housed over 100,000 orphans in his lifetime. And when you read about his life, there's actually so many miraculous stories of God's provision, very timely donations of provision. Um, and we see this man choose time and time again to default to pray instead of just worry or give up. There's one story that famously stands out, and uh, it's this moment where he had run out of funds to feed the children in the orphanage. And the story is retold based on an account recorded in his journals. Listen to this. One morning, I want you to imagine this, if you were looking after the orphanage and all these children. One morning, all the plates and cups and the bowls on the table were empty. There was no food in the pantry and no money to buy food. The children were standing, waiting for their morning meal. When Mueller said, children, you know must, we must be on time for school. And then lifting up his hands, he prayed, dear father, we thank thee for what thou art going to give us, food to eat. I think we should pray more of these and those. We just throw that in like George Mueller, come on. Anyway, there was a knock at the door, okay? There was, as soon as he prayed, literally, a knock at the door. Okay, the baker stood there and said, Mr. Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. Somehow I felt you didn't have bread for breakfast and the Lord wanted me to send you some. So I got up at 2 a.m. and baked some fresh bread and I brought it. And Mr. Mueller thanked the baker and no sooner had he left when there was a second knock at the door and it was the milkman. And he announced that his milk cart had broken down right in front of the orphanage and he would like to give the children his cans of fresh milk so he could empty his wagon and repair it. What a cool testimony about God's provision. Very timely provision. And you know, I love that George Mueller directed the children to pray, but also, did you notice that he gave thanks? He gave thanks to the Lord in advance for what he was about to do. Literally, no food, no money in front of them. But he just decided that through his thanksgiving, he was gonna demonstrate incredible trust and dependency on the Lord. What actually, which brings us to the second step on the pathway to peace. The first thing is to pray. And the second thing is to give thanks. 
we give thanks. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, Paul says this, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Church, when do we give thanks? In all circumstances. All circumstances. Um, that can be really good and easy when things are going well and really challenging when things are difficult, you know. But the truth is there is something in, in any situation that you can be thankful for. I mean, you may be battling with cancer right now, and I can't even imagine, I can't even start to imagine in my mind what that must be like. That is horrible. That is a, a terrible situation. And yet, you can still lift up thanks to God and say, God, I thank you. I don't, like, I don't want this cancer. I wish it wasn't in my life. And I pray that it goes away. But I thank you that you were with me. I thank you that I have the promise of your presence. You can thank God for that. You know, maybe you are battling, you're walking through some loss and grief. And that hurts and that's heavy, you know. But you can say, God, I thank you that this life is temporary and there is a forever with you, an eternity with you, where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there's no more tears. And I can look forward to that day, even though right now this pain is so hard to bear. You know, gratitude is refreshing to the ears. Whining is not. <laughs> I'm sure all the parents in the room can relate to that, you know? How wonderful when your child says thank you and, appreci and appreciates what you've done. How frustrating when all you hear is ceaseless whining. And, uh, you know, when things are going wrong in life and we feel worried, one of our natural go-to reactions is to forget all the blessings. Don't we, isn't it natural for us more to narrow in on the negative, right? What is that one thing or those few things that we're lacking that's not there, that's frustrating us and that we can grumble about? We wallow in self-pity. Why me? Why is this my circumstance? Why is this happening to me? You know, take a look at the history of God's people and you can see a journey of battling with grumbling and self-pity. In the desert, they grumbled about the food they grumbled about Moses' leadership. Yeah. When they finally made it to the promised land, they grumbled about not having a king, an earthly king like all the other nations. When they, when they were in exile in Babylon because of their disobedience, they complained about the plight in a foreign land. It just was never good enough. There was always something that bothered them and they complained about. And, you know, this doesn't mean that as people we can't be real or we've got to put on a fake smile and we've got to pretend like we're okay all the time. It's actually okay to tell people you're not okay and to tell people like, I'm really going through something, right? That's okay. But I think what we need to ask ourselves is what's our first reaction? What's our go-to, right? In all circumstances, is our first reaction just stop and go, Lord, I don't like this, but I'm going to choose right now to pray and I'm going to give you thanks for the good things that I am seeing that are happening? Or is your first go-to, you know, to find that friend and just dump on them? Like just vent and complain and, and just basically focus on everything that's negative. Yeah. You know, or is your first go-to that you just go on social media and you just, you know, post whatever is anxious flowing out of your heart? Is that your first step? You know, I have found whenever I vent or complain about something, it actually never makes me feel better in the long run. In the moment, oh, it feels good. Like in the moment, it's cathartic. And you're like, oh, good, it's done. Feel better. But it actually never alleviates my anxiety. Just like finding those temporary fixes to try and get peace, grumbling or complaining or venting just never really helps in the long run. Grumbling will keep you focused on what you lack thankfulness will keep you focused on the many blessings of God in your life. And it actually helps you keep perspective. And that's one of the keys. Now, sometimes though, in order to get our mindset uh, of giving thanks, we need to slow down and we actually need to take notice of what is around us. Slow down. You know, one of the things that is so beautiful about the autumn season here in Canada is the leaves changing color. It is stunning, right? You've got the beautiful reds and oranges and yellows. Have you ever just taken a moment to look at one leaf? Like just to pick up one leaf and look at it. I remember this encounter I had with the Lord probably like 15 years ago. I was at a friend's cottage, just having a quiet moment with the Lord, sitting out in the forest. And I just felt like the Holy Spirit said, just pick up one leaf and look at it. And I was just amazed at the detail in one leaf 
the lines, the gradation of color, like it's just beautiful. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, if I put that much detail into one leaf that's there in the spring over summer and then dies in the fall, all these leaves all over the world, how much more detail do I put in your life? How much more do I care for you when I put that much detail into a leaf? You know, he is an amazing artist. And so when we take that time to slow down and actually appreciate the little things, even just the beauty of a leaf, it's amazing what it can do for your soul. So church, we pray, we give thanks, and that helps us accomplish the third thing that the Apostle Paul encourages us to do, and that is to focus our thoughts on what what is true, what is honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. When I am in a cycle of ruminating or thinking about something that's bothering me, you know, those those thoughts that keep you up at 2 a.m. and you wish you could fall back asleep, but you're just trying to solve that problem in your mind or you're thinking back to that conversation with that person that, you know, is making you anxious or worried or thinking about the next day, the task that you have to do and you're like, oh, I got to do this. How's that going to happen? My thoughts are never true, honorable, or lovely at 2 a.m. in the morning when I'm ruminating. They just aren't. They just aren't. What are my thoughts? They're scary. Sometimes they're scary thoughts. You know, they can be frustrating thoughts. They're discouraging thoughts. But it's like a swirling mess of negativity. It's never on those things. But God calls us to be a people who focus our thoughts in another direction. Like we got to get the wheels spinning another way. You got to get them moving in another direction. But how do we do that? I actually wanted to offer just some real practical things that you can try. And maybe you do, and just to encourage you to keep doing these things or try them if you have not tried them. So the first thing, something that helps me, very simple, is meditating on the Word of God and writing out scriptures and memorizing scripture. Because worry is just thinking about things over and over and over again. You know, and if you're meditating on scripture, what are you doing? Thinking about the word of God over and over and over again. And you're letting it sink into your heart. In Psalm 1, it says, blessed is the one who meditates on God's word day and night. I want to be that kind of person. Wake up in the morning thinking about God's word. Through the day, thinking about God's word. When I go to sleep at night, thinking about God's word. Letting it renew my mind. Um, The second thing that helps me, especially when I'm just stuck in a thought or I feel like my problems are so overwhelming, I just go and help somebody else. There's nothing like getting the focus off yourself and going to focus on somebody else that just helps alleviate your anxiety. Sometimes we can be so stuck in our problems, we lose perspective and we're trying to figure out how to solve our own problem. Why don't you go out and help someone else make their day better? You know, be the reason someone else smiles today and go write someone an encouraging note or go visit someone who's in the hospital. It's amazing, again, what can happen when we get our eyes off ourself and on to other people. Um, the third thing, begin your day, end your day listing off the good things, listing off the good things. And you know, sometimes it's like, I don't even know what's good. I'll j- just wake up, open your eyes and say, you know what, God, your word says your mercies are new every morning. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for breath in my lungs. You know, you end your day and just say, God, thank you for the food I got to eat today. Thank you I had clean water to drink. You know, all of those things that, especially us in the first world, can take for granted. Give God thanks for those things. Uh, The fourth thing that you can do, put on some worship music. Let your mind just soak in those words. Something shifts in our soul when we praise God, when we worship God. And it just is amazing how that situation that seems so big, that seems so impossible starts to shrink inside because you magnify the Lord in your worship and that shrinks that shrinks what you are worried about. Uh, another thing that helped me, actually I found over COVID really, during 2020, um, I found a new hobby that I really like. And you know, you might all have hobbies, different hobbies that you engage in that kind of engage your mind and um, just get your mind focused on something you enjoy, maybe sports or music or whatever it is. But um, I found that I really like photography. Uh-huh. And I just started going out. Uh, you know, I had some extra time, literally just with my iPhone. I'm super amateur. And just started taking photos. And it was so therapeutic to me um, because I would notice things that normally I would pass by. Uh-huh. I'd go on a walk and be like, oh, Never noticed that before. I want to take a picture of that. Cool, look at the lighting. Like, look at that detail I never noticed before. And it made me slow down and actually notice the environment around me. And so I just found for me, that was something that 
um, really helps me. I'd love to get a camera one day. That'd be cool, like an actual legit camera. But for now, I'm on my iPhone going around the world taking photos. Um, but yeah, something that works for you that you just enjoy and it gets your mind on something else. Um, and then the last thing that I would say is find an example for each type of thought that Paul lists, okay? So sometimes I will sit there and I'll just say, okay, God, what is true? What is true? God, is true that you love me. What's something noble? Um, Jesus, you died on the cross for me. That's noble. What's something that's right? It is right to give God thanks and praise. Uh, what's something pure? The laughter and playfulness of children. It's just beautiful. It's so pure. What's, what is lovely? God, the falling leaves are beautiful. You know, your creation is lovely, Lord. What is admirable? Lord, I love, maybe, you, you know, I think about a friend that week who's battling through something and I think, wow, God, that's admirable that that friend is battling through that and still trusting you. What's excellent? Lord, your word is excellent. Your love is excellent. Your plans are excellent. Uh, something worthy of praise. God, I give you praise because of all the ways you provided for me today. Just go through that list, sitting down, writing it out, or going for a walk, and choose something for each of those things that he lists in Philippians. I was scrolling through Instagram one day, as you do, and uh, there was a post by a man named Pastor Craig Grishel. I don't know if any of you are on Instagram following him, but he just posts amazing things. And especially about the topic of worrying and anxiety. He'll post um, quite a bit about that. And one of the things that he says is what you worry about most reveals where you trust God the least. What you worry about most reveals where you trust God the least. So challenging, so true. Those areas where I trust God the most, I'm like, God, you've got this. Amazing, I'm not worried about this. The areas where I find myself worried, absolutely. I'm like, I don't know how you're going to handle this one, God. I don't know if you're going to do this the way I want you to do it. I don't know if you're going to answer this in the time that I want you to answer it. I don't know if I like your plan. <laughs> you know, and I find myself worrying. Um, so it's challenging to me. But the other thing that uh, he posted, which was, really caught my attention, was basically this clip. And it got me thinking about how worry is absolutely useless at the end of the day. It really is. Even, I mean, even Jesus says that there's no point in worrying because, you know, seek first the kingdom and all will be added. But he says this. He says, um, Pastor Craig Rochelle says, there's three possibilities for what you're worried about. Three possibilities. And all of them end out being really okay in the end. Okay, the first one is that thing will never, ever happen. Like you're worrying about it, never happens. He actually quoted, he said, studies have showed that less than 10% of what you were actually worried about will come to pass. So nine out of 10 times, that thing's not even gonna happen. The second thing, second outcome of what you're worried about, it may happen, but not that bad. You actually may end up liking how things turn out. So it's actually okay. Yep. And then the third thing he says is, okay, you worried about something, you know what? That thing came to pass, but what? But the faithfulness of God will shine through the situation and you will experience the faithfulness of God like never before. You know, I've had things that I've worried about where I have um, they've never come to pass. And I go, ooh, thank the Lord. Okay, why was I worried? Or, you know, I got so caught up worrying about something, never even happened. I realized all that time was so wasted, worrying when I could have been praising God or helping someone else or, you know, doing something valuable with my time. I've had situations where, yeah, what I worried about kind of happened, but I was like, not so bad, God. Okay, you got me. You worked this out for good. This is, yeah. this is okay. And then, you know what? I've had times where the thing I worried about, it does happen and it hurts and it's hard. That's a hard place to walk through. But again, it's in those hard places where I've grown closer to the Lord. And I've actually seen, Lord, you are so faithful. And you allowed this to show me your faithfulness that you were with me. I want you to think about King David's words in Psalm 27, verses 1 to 3, and then jumping into 13 to 14. Think about his perspective about situations in his life. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then, even then will I be confident. And he goes on to say in verse 13, I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait 
for the Lord. And if King David, I think to myself, if King David had an army coming at him and he could say, I'm still confident in the Lord. I know God's gonna work this out. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is by my side. Then how much more can we give thanks to God and just say, God, I'm gonna trust you. Just like King David did, I am gonna trust you. You are working this out. And you know, the amazing thing is, God says that as we take those steps to pray and give thanks, there is an amazing promise, church. It's the promise of his peace guarding our hearts and our minds, guarding our hearts and our minds, protecting our hearts and our minds. And as we focus our thoughts intentionally, okay, as we live to the best of our ability to focus on following the Lord, it says the God of peace will be with you. Think about that. He's not a God of worry. He's not a God of anxiety. He's not a God of stress. He is the God of peace. And the Bible says he is the Prince of Peace. So with that in mind, I, I want to pray for two people, two groups of people, not two people, two groups. Hopefully there might be more than two people. Maybe there's only two people. Anyway, first I want to pray for you in the room or if you're watching there online and you really have like a stronghold of anxiety or worry and something I've said resonates with you and you're thinking, I really want prayer for that. I want to experience the peace of God. I've let worry control me. It's been my master. I don't want to, I want the Lord to be my master. I want to surrender this area of my life to God and believe that he can lead me on that pathway to peace and bring freedom. And so I wanna pray for you. So if everyone could just bow their heads, close their eyes, um, you know, just so there is um, just privacy if you, you want to pray that uh, prayer with me. If you would just um, be so bold as just to lift your hand. And I want to pray for us today that God would bring healing. I've seen him bring healing in my life and I'm believing in faith that he can bring healing to yours. Father, I just thank you for, for those who have raised their hands either in this room or, or watching online. And you know their story, God. You know the hard things that they are walking through. You know the anxiety, you know the sleepless nights, you know the worry, you know the fear, you know every single detail, God. But we thank you for your promise of peace. We thank you that you have not left us alone, that you say that we can pray, we can give thanks, we can focus our thoughts and you are with us. The God of peace is with us, the, act, the Prince of peace. And so God, for anybody who is encountering anxiety and believing for breakthrough right now in the name of Jesus, I declare God that their mind is at peace. It says in your word that we have the mind of Christ. And I thank you God that they can walk in your victory, in your strength, in your power, in your freedom, God. I pray for freedom over their soul and over their mind in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen. And uh, the second group that I, I want to pray for, I want to pray for anybody who wants to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. I want to pray for you. Uh, if you want to know this God of peace, if you've been trying to get peace in all the other places but the Lord, now's the time to come to God because you won't find true lasting peace anywhere else. The world will try and commodify peace to you. It will say, just go on that vacation and you'll get peace. The world will say, you know, just buy that product, experience peace. It's not true peace. The only true peace comes from Jesus Christ. Everything else is a counterfeit. So if that is you in this room, just again, if everyone would um, bow your head, close your eyes, um, and you wanna make that decision, you can repeat this prayer after me. And it, it is simply just a prayer saying, God, I'm done doing it my own way. I want you to be my God. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my savior. I need to be rescued from my sins. I need you to give me a new life and a new heart. And I promise you that he is so faithful to his promises and he will come into your life, come into your heart and he will change you and make you new. So if that is you, you can just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. Today, I make a choice to follow you. Lord, forgive me of all my sins, wash me clean and make me new. I give my life to you, I give my heart to you, and I am now a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. 
amen, amen. And you know, we're so excited for you if you prayed that prayer. It is the best decision that you could ever make. And Pastor John is gonna come now and he's gonna give you some next steps for what you can do. Thank you, church. Wow, well, what an absolutely incredible message from Laura. Come on, can we give claps and snaps for Laura? What an amazing, amazing message. And you know what? If you made that decision to, make, to follow Jesus, we want to congratulate you. We believe it's the greatest decision that you could ever make. And uh, we've got a Bible that we would love to be able to send to you. If you are in Canada, we've got this and uh, we want to be able to put this into your hands. There is a link in the description that you can fill out right now. And, uh, or you can let us know in the chat. That's the decision you made. And our team would love to reach out to you and uh, be able to help you get started on this journey. And you know, Matt, wherever you are watching from today, we believe that God's best is for you. And I'd encourage you to watch back this message. You know, maybe you took lots of notes the first time. Maybe you kind of joined in partway through. Go back, watch the whole message. We're going to believe it's going to bless your life and really help you on your journey with God. But hey, we've come to the end of our service. And uh, just a reminder, if you are in Toronto, we would love to have you join us in the room next weekend. We've got a 10 a.m. and a 12 p.m. service at Triple Eight Young Street. And, and we have Heart and Soul at 5 p.m. It's going to be absolutely phenomenal. We're going to hear about all that God is doing. We're going to hear from Pastors Damien and Julie. We're going to worship together, just celebrate together. So make sure you're in the room for that. But before we head out today, can I pray for us? I think that'd be awesome. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you have done today. God, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for your word today that it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. God, would you help us as we walk forward in boldness this week to trust you, to lean into you, to give thanks to you in those moments. God, I pray your blessing on every person in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone said together, amen, amen. Church, we love you. We'll see you next weekend. God bless.